I remember starting off that morning as a regular day. At that time, I was a distribution spicer. So uh, we got our work assignment, and it was to go down to Broadway between Barclay and Park Place. All of a sudden, you heard this rumbling thunder sound, then a soot in the air, all coming rushing toward us. Then just when everything went chaotic. And we saw people jumping out of the buildings. You still had to maintain um, continuity of the system. Uh, but one of the first things you know, I did and, and the department did was account for our people. This is gonna, you know, we should be doing this uh, with cable on the street, doing shunts. He said at this point, he goes, you guys got a good plan, it'll work, you know, let's get it going. We were uh, continuously updating the media, helping um, uh, the rest of corporate affairs, updating um, elected officials and government agencies, uh, and we did that through daily press briefings. And I think 20 years on, I, I can still be brought to tears by, by those things and the feelings I had that day. It's one of those days you get after the summer where it's, it's cool, it's dry, you know, you, you know fall's coming. And I remember joking to myself as I was arguing with people to get them out of the yard and whatnot that, wow, I should be out fishing today, I shouldn't be in work. I remember it as if it were yesterday. I was working in engineering on the 15th floor at Four Irving Place in Manhattan and had just recently moved to a new desk a few days prior that had a window looking westward. Got up to the office. I remember I went and got coffee or something. I got into the off, up into my office, and one of the clerks just wandered in and said, hey, a plane just hit the Trade Center. I saw the first plane go by. It was almost as if you could reach out and touch it. It was so close. Uh, clearly something was wrong with the flight plan or the flight pattern. You could see the letters American Airlines right on the plane. And I mentioned it, and one of my colleagues then got up and looked out the southbound window and saw the plane hit. Uh, and then we all joined him to see the view uh, and the damage. Then I received a call uh, to report down to the World Trade Center and we had to shut the steam service off to the building. Figured it was somebody, you know, off course with a small Cessna or a small plane and then all the phones started lighting up. Another colleague said, here comes another one. And you could see the other plane coming down the Hudson River. It overshot the Trade Center and looped back, it made a U-turn, and it was heading apparently straight for us. At one point, all we could see were three circles, the fuselage and the two engines on either side of it. And then at the last moment, as it approached the Trade Center, it banked in and hit. And at that point, you knew it wasn't anything that was normal, it was, something was really wrong. I was writing a, a message to employees to please stay off phones and stay off emails unless it was an emergency, and the local news uh, anchors were on talking about what was going on and I glanced over a couple minutes later and Tom Brokaw was on and he was the first person I remember saying it was a, an attack on America. I was with my partner Will Cordero and Will and I had just dropped some folks off uh, down in lower Manhattan and I turned to Will and I said look I, I just want to run into the concourse for a minute um, I just got to grab something otherwise I'm gonna forget and I don't know why Will said what he said. Um, but he said, look, we, we've got a whole day. I promise you, I, I promise you, I will remind you that you need to run this errand. And had Will not made that choice, I would have been walking underneath the path of the jet fuel and the fuselage. And everybody ran to the window. And I ran to the window with him, and I remember looking out the window and seeing the towers with the billowing smoke. And then they were gone. And as he was walking down to the site, Dick Martin Morgan had came to our location and had a conversation with us. And knowing after that that he never made it, this just gave him uh, just something to think about. And the first tower crumbled like it was a TV um, show. And people began to cry um, in the office. But that first evening was really when a lot of critical decisions were made to how we were gonna respond, at least on the electric side. Uh, most people don't know this, but the original plan was to set 100 poles going down West Street to run three or four feeders to pick up the stock exchanges. And we started walking down West Street and 
about somewhere around Chambers or so, you realize this plan was never going to work because of the way the buildings had come down. There, you know, most of the debris was in the middle of West Street, and West Street was blocked. This is going to, you know, we should be doing this uh, with cable on the street doing shunts. He said, at this point, he goes, you guys got a good plan. It'll work. You know, let's get it going. And that's what we did. And it ended up being the way we ended up restoring Lower Manhattan with all these shunts. Because we had a large area of the steam distribution main isolated, we had to develop plans to re-energize um, and re-energize in sections. It's not like you could open one valve and re-energize all of lower downtown, right? So we had to close valves around the World Trade Center and then work our way south from the north end and turn on the steam main in sections. And we relieved the manager and a couple other folks that were on site down at the uh, emergency bus that was on site at that point. And I remember walking in and they were covered from head to toe. And I remember looking at them and wondering, what, what, are, we, what are we into here? As it was very important to us to, to continually update employees as well. And we sent out daily status reports so employees could understand the progress the company was making in the restoration of Lower Manhattan. And when we came around the back side, one of the things that you'll never forget is that uh, there was a diner there. And, um, and at the counter was, was plates and coffee and food, like people, and people, you could, you, could, you could see that people were there at that particular time when that event happened, and it was like frozen in time. Mm -hmm. and, and you say to yourself, all of this happened, and now you see all of these different entities, cranes and people from gas and people from out of state, and all kinds of dump trucks and earth moving machinery, backhoes and, and machines to cut the street to allow us to drop cable in the ground. Anything that you could think of that was gonna help in any way, shape, form or fashion was there. During those times there was no such thing as a mundane task or an ordinary task. Everything, the sanctity of work was something that we all recognized how important uh, our, our jobs are and how important it is to keep carrying on no matter the circumstances. You know, we talk about us being the fabric of New York a lot, right? It's a, it's a common refrain we use. But in that moment, we really were. We provided them information. And sometimes we just let them cry, right? Sometimes you just had to sit there with people who had lost everything and had watched people die in front of them and support them. Sometimes it was just, just letting people cry. was like a large, at least for the first few days that I remember, there was like a large group of people that would be there holding signs and stuff. And no matter how tired you were, as you drove by, they cheer you and they'd raise the signs. It gives you chills just thinking about it. But it also gave you that motivation, no matter how tired you were, you were coming back first thing in the morning and do it another 18 hours or whatever. Because you just felt you were doing your part to help them. And it was very clear to me during that time that I had chosen the right company because I was working with the right people. Um, when I had time to catch up with friends, uh, they told me that they were jealous um, that I worked at Con Edison, that while they were home uh, watching the news 24-7, um, as almost all of us, it seemed, were at the time, one way or another, um, they were aware that Con Edison was part of bringing the city back from its knees and they were jealous that I had such a job with such great purpose. Um, and I understand that because I was very proud to work here. I am very proud to work here. You know, looking back on what we were able to accomplish, right, during one of the most tragic times in our generation um, was something to be proud of, right? Not only as a company, but as a society in general, uh, because this wasn't just a New York event, right? The world was involved. Mm -hmm.